Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're in Isaiah chapter 24. Let's look at verse 1. Look, the Lord is stripping the earth bare and making it desolate. He will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants, people and priest alike, servant and master, female servant and mistress, buyer and seller, lender and borrower, creditor and debtor. The earth will be stripped completely bare and will be totally plundered, for the Lord has spoken this message. That's unique for, for Isaiah to add that particular qualifier on. The earth mourns and withers, the world wastes away and withers, the exalted people of the earth waste away, the earth is polluted by its inhabitants, for they have transgressed teachings, overstepped decrees, and broken the permanent covenant. Therefore, a curse has consumed the earth, and its inhabitants have become guilty. The earth's inhabitants have been burned, and only a few survive. The new wine mourns, and the vine withers. All the carousers now groan. The joyful tambourines have ceased. The noise of jub uh, the jubilant has stopped. The joyful lyre has ceased. They no longer sing and drink wine. Beer is bitter to those who drink it. The city of chaos is shattered. Every house is closed to entry. Remember verse 10's reference to the city of chaos because it's going to come up in the next chapter. Right? In the streets they cry for wine, all joy grows dark, earth's rejoicing goes into exile, only desolation remains in the city, its gate has collapsed in ruins, for this is how it will be on the earth among the nations, like a harvested olive tree, like a gleaning after a grape harvest. They raise their voices, they sing out, they proclaim in the west the majesty of the Lord, therefore in the east they honor the Lord. Uh, uh, in, in the coasts and the islands of the west, honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. From the ends of the earth we hear songs, the splendor of the righteous one. But I said, I waste away, I waste away, woe is me. The treacherous act treacherously, the treacherous deal very treacherously. Panic, pit, and trap await you who dwell on the earth. Whoever flees at the sound of panic will fall into a pit, and whoever escapes from the pit will be caught in a trap. For the windows on high are opened, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is completely devastated. The earth is split open. The earth is violently shaken. The earth staggers, staggers like a drunkard and sways like a hut. The earth's rebellion weighs it down and it falls, never to rise again. On that day, the Lord will punish the army of the heights in the heights and the kings of the ground on the ground. They will be gathered together like prisoners in a pit. They will be confined to a dungeon. After many days, they will be punished. The moon will be put to shame and the sun disgraced because the Lord of armies will reign as king on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and he will display his glory in the presence of his elders. Isaiah has shifted in his audience as of chapter 24, and it's going to continue this way for a few chapters. He's going to speak now to the whole earth. Chapters 24 through 27 have a broader audience, in chapters 13 through 23, we saw individual nations and even in some cases a city addressed. All right. Now it's the whole earth. It's everybody. And the scope of the prof uh, prophecy fulfillment timeline has also expanded not only beyond Isaiah's lifetime and the lifetime of his original recipients, it even really regards us as part of the massive audience of the original recipients. Isaiah, in this sense, was a New Testament book because it would go beyond even the first coming of the Messiah. He would speak in chapters 52 and 53, which are really kind of, really kind of one. Uh, we divide them into two chapters. It's really one oracle describing perfectly and obviously and very clearly the Messiah. 
But in these chapters, in chapters 24 through 27, you're going to see that he's speaking about the whole earth, all depravity across all time. And it speaks broadly on the overall timeline of redemptive history. It speaks almost like Romans 8, which is a New Testament book, of course, describing the state of things post the fall, how all of creation is groaning. Or think 1 Corinthians 15, how all that is perishable longs to be clothed in the imperishable. All right, or is that that's 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 4 and 5 and 6 kind of run along this, this theme. And it describes the sin-stained state of creation and how we're longing for redemption. We're longing to be made new. Isaiah talks about how God's going to do exactly that. Look closely at this set of couplets at the beginning of the chapter, whether you are people, with a, uh, both, both people and priest alike, servant and master, female servant and mistress, buyer and seller, lender and borrower, creditor and debtor, your financial status, your hierarchical status, your cultural caste, if you will, C-A-S-T-E, is irrelevant. We're all unified in that we're all subjugated to God. It doesn't matter how well you've risen within society. It doesn't matter how much you've saved up. It doesn't matter how many followers you have on Instagram. It doesn't matter uh, how many simoleons you have in the bank. Every one of us alike, we're all unified in that we must give an account before God. And the prayer here is you would do so encountering God as your savior and not only as your judge. The text continues, the, the earth mourns and withers. The world wastes away and withers. See, he's not just naming... He's not just naming Tyre. He's not just naming Moab. He's not just naming Arabia or Babylon or Assyria or even Jerusalem. He's naming the whole earth. This is a meta nonfiction moment. As we've studied the book of Isaiah, we've seen it speak to ancient audiences long since past. And now at this point, the book we're reading starts to describe the room we're sitting in. Imagine that horrific moment if you're reading a thriller by the fireplace and you're sitting there quietly and peacefully, and suddenly the narrative starts to describe the murderer approaching a house that perfectly describes your house. And it describes the painting on the wall next to you, the fireplace by your feet, the socks that you're wearing at the moment, and even the book in your lap. And this is a horrifying, striking moment where like, I'm reading a true account of what is happening to me right now. And it is not good news, especially if you're not in Christ. That's the moment that's just taken place as of the beginning of chapter 24 of the book of Isaiah. So he moves in his scope to encompass the whole earth and he shifts the timeline to describe future events, even, even, uh, even coinciding with the second coming of the Messiah. So Isaiah includes apocalyptic elements in his prophecy. He's describing the same kind of things that have taken place uh, across cultures past. He's indicted, for example, the former leadership of Judah for their utter abdication of their duties to care for the poor and the needy. While, uh, while, they were, while they were supposed to be addressing the needs of the widow, of the orphan, and adhering to everything that the Old Testament prescribed for the care of the alien, the orphan, the widow, they were just drinking and partying, and they weren't actually doing anything to help anybody. So this now pivots to describe the leadership, not just of Judah, but of the whole earth. But it says the party's over. The party is over. It even says that uh, beer is bitter to the one who drinks it, verse 9. All right, so the escapism is no longer going to have its effect. It's going to become bitter to you. And it speaks to the city of chaos. All right, the city of chaos is shattered. That's verse 10. Every house is closed to entry in the streets. They cry for wine. All joy grows dark. Earth's rejoicing goes into exile. It then uses imagery of a harvest, all right? And this is deliberate. The way that you harvest uh, an olive tree is by shaking it, and then everything comes down. So this is going to be a violent shaking. There are earthquakes that are described in the outpouring of the woes prophesied in Revelation, for example, 
in Revelation 11, you get the two witnesses. They proclaim the gospel to the whole earth. That was used to sort of mock the credibility of scripture for most of human history until the advent of television. And then the whole earth looks at their dead bodies. The whole earth even will bear witness as they resurrect three days later in the sort of redux imitation of uh, the ministry of Christ, not in the way that the Antichrist will do it, the beast will do it, but in a way that is prophesied by God. It's possible, it's plausible, it's speculated that these guys could be Elijah and Moses, who are the two witnesses. Either way, that's not relevant. What is relevant is that after this resurrection, you'll see one of the great woes of Revelation take place, and it's this massive earthquake. Everybody's so happy to see these two witnesses who have been proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, defending themselves miraculously, heard miraculously, um, absolutely just undeniably, uh, undeniably just owning anybody who tries to approach them, tries to deny them. They're, they are there to help further condemn the earth. And I believe that, and I'm hopeful too, that people will be saved because of their ministry. These witnesses serve either to save those who believe or to further condemn those who deny. And then when they are killed at last, um, in the timeline that God allocates and allows for it, the whole earth will party. And ironically, it'll be kind of like Christmas time. People will get together to exchange gifts because the two witnesses are dead. And then amidst the revelry, they resurrect and there's an earthquake and then thousands of people will die. This is prophesied in Revelation 11 and it echoes what's taking place here. All right, that the revelry gives way to despair, that God will shake the earth like an olive tree. It also just says like a gleaning after a grape harvest. The, the harvest season can be traumatic for the plant that is harvested, and that's what God's doing here. These also bring our attention back to our study of Matthew. When we looked at, uh, when we looked at the Gospel of Matthew and we studied these books, fulfillment, right? We saw God use imagery of harvest time to describe the end of days. We saw the parable of the wheat and the weeds, for example, wherein God is the one who separates true believers from false believers. It's all in his hands. We're, we don't have the authority to say this person's saved and this person's not. All of it is in God's hand. At the end of days, he's the one who harvests and he's the one who separates the wheat from the weeds. They raise their voices. They sing out. They proclaim in the West the majesty of the Lord. There's verse 14. Good news. Have you noticed this theme in the last few chapters of Isaiah? There's always this, I mean, wow, this this wrath, this discipline that's proclaimed from on high. And then there's this glimmer of hope, this remnant. That is always the way it goes with God's proclamations of wrath and justice, and especially his discipline. In the flood, there was the ark. Okay, in Sodom and Gomorrah, there was Lot and his family. In this outpouring of wrath, there's still gonna be some who will proclaim the Lord. All right, they will proclaim with their voices the majesty of the Lord. That's what 24, 14 says. Therefore, in the east, honor the Lord. On the coasts and the islands of the west, honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. From the ends of the earth, we hear songs, the splendor of the righteous one. So we have gone from the east to the west and the coasts and the islands. We've covered every imaginable landform here. This would include the Isthmi, the, this, would in, this would include the peninsula, uh, peninsulas, this would include uh, the east, the west, from every hemisphere, they pro proclaim the righteous one. And then even amidst the proclamation of the glory, even this, the, this proclamation of the majesty of the Lord that's prophesied, that's foretold, there's still again a bit of woe. And we see this in verse 16, but I said, I waste away, woe is me, the treacherous act treacherously, the treacherous deal very treacherously. It's a statement of reality. This is how things will go amid, uh, amidst, the, uh, uh, amidst the depravity of mankind. This is not describing the final covenant, if you will, in in heaven, it's describing um, it's describing the state of things uh, in in Revelation, right? That the first person author here, Isaiah, is the vessel through whom the Holy Spirit is inspired in these words, and he says, "I waste away, I waste away. Woe is me." We've heard those words before in Isaiah chapter. Six. He feels conviction not only for his own individual sin. I am a man of unclean lips. He reflects also on the sinfulness of his culture. I live among a people of unclean lips. That's being echoed here as well. The treacherous act treacherously. The treacherous deal very treacherously. So he's lamenting the fallen state of things. 
Panic, pit, and trap await you who dwell on the earth. Whoever flees at the sound of panic will fall into a pit, and whoever escapes from the pit will be caught in a trap. For the windows on high are opened, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. There's again further evidence of this earthquake-like judgment, the shaking of the olive tree. It, uh, it also runs parallel to the woes of the book of Revelation, especially Revelation chapter 11. The earth is completely devastated. The earth is split open. The sheer staggering scale, the cataclysmic nature of God's outpouring of his wrath upon sin on the earth even affects the ground beneath our feet, the bedrock beneath the earth's crust, as we've called it. When God set his prisoners free in the book of Acts, he did so by shaking even the foundations of the prison. This is God showing that you may persecute my prophets and you may put them in jail, but I own the rock that constructs the jail and the foundation beneath it is mine to do what I will with. You cannot stop God when he is going about the business of redeeming his own and delivering his own. He splits the earth open. Imagine the effect that that has on the sense of security for the wealthy rebels against God. You can't do anything about that. There's nothing you could do to stop that. God, both physically and philosophically, just owns the bedrock upon which our lives and our worldviews are built. When we build our lives on the rock, we are safe from the coming storm. When we place our trust in him, we place our trust in the one who owns the bedrock right down to the core from an infinite line stretching from the very epicenter of the sphere of the earth, stretching outward into infinity beyond what we could imagine. All of it is God's and he is sovereign. So he can shake what he wants to shake. He can break the earth open if he wants to. There's nowhere we can hide from this consequence for our rebellion. It says earth's rebellion weighs it down and it falls never to rise again. That's verse 20. Verse 21, on that day, the Lord will punish the army of the heights in the heights, right where you have committed these acts of adultery. Uh, it's possible here he's alluding to uh, the worship, the, the pagan worship through uh, Asherah. When, it, when you would see Asherah poles torn down by various leaders throughout the Old Testament, this was actually a way of repenting from sexual sin because Asherah poles may have been phallic imagery. And then to worship in the heights in, in accordance with this pagan practice was to was to commit uh, commit indecent acts sexually. And so th there's always this sexual draw to pagan uh, to pagan faiths. Within Mormonism, there comes the promise that you're going to get a planet full of women you can have sex with. Within Islam, if you're a jihadist, you get 72 virgins you can just have sex with forever. It's really gross. There's this there, there's this uh, perverted draw incentive to particularly draw men into into pagan faith systems uh, and I'm, I'm struck by that i'm struck by the juxtaposition of that with uh, the christian faith wherein you know as a christian man i saved my virginity for my wife right um and even then when i think about heaven i'm not i'm not guaranteed that i'm still going to be married to her in heaven jesus's words about not being married or given away in marriage in heaven, but being more like the angels doesn't really leave a lot of room uh, for the hope that we'll be able to have sex when we're in heaven, all right? The, but we will be more like the angels in heaven. I'm struck by the contrast between my worldview as a Christian and then the pagan incentive to be able to have sex after death. It's always there, it seems. And uh, when Old Testament believers would repent from their adherence to these pagan practices that they picked up from other nations around by intermarrying in and bringing those practices aboard, when there was a mass repentance, there was a demolition of the Asherah poles, which paints kind of a funny picture in your head. On the day, the Lord will punish the army of the heights in the heights. All right, you're busted right at the very locale of your sin. The kings of the ground on the ground. Okay, whether you're on the heights or on the ground, wherever you have, have, have rebelled against the Lord, you're going to be punished there. They will be gathered together like prisoners in a pit. They will be confined to a dungeon. After many days, they will be punished. The moon will be put to shame. The sun disgraced because the Lord of armies will reign as king on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and he will display his glory in the presence of his elders. The elders named here are likely the 24 elders that we see in the throne room around God who lay their crowns at his feet.
and they proclaim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This is what the angels speak out about God. And then these elders lay their crowns down uh, at his feet in proclamation of his glory. So Isaiah is going to pivot uh, now from this proclamation of the judgment of the earth to salvation in the next chapter. Okay, and then that chapter is covered by some of our other materials here uh, in our scope and sequence. We'll be we'll be reviewing chapter twenty five uh, through our sermon this weekend. All right, so remember chapter twenty four about the judgment of the earth because it sets the context for this week's sermon.